<laughs> All right, so we say just a camera for those things. So I just so now, where do you want to be? Do I need to stand near? No, no, you can just move around. If you move that space, what I'm going to do is plug in you know, the uh, power up just in case you know, you know, the, we don't mind going on halfway through, which sometimes can happen. Be careful Hopefully that's uh, charging. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Uh, well, it's my pleasure. I think it's our pleasure to have Professor Phil Thor here in person. It is much better than do it through Zoom, of course. So, uh, Professor Phil Thor, this is PD in uh, October of the university. We spent some time at uh, Microsoft Research in uh, Redmond. He came back to Oxford, but to Brooks University, also Brooks University. But presently, he is again with uh, Oxford University. And, well, he has a long list of awards and things like that. That takes too much time, and it puts <laughs> can leave him without uh, much time, I think. So I just uh, mentioned a few recent ones. He was elected Fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering in 2019 and Fellow of the Royal Society, which is indeed very important in 2021, for contributions to computer vision. And in 2021, he was also made Turing Artificial Intelligence World Leading Researcher Fellow. So please go ahead. Thank you. Uh... Okay, well, thanks for that. So, uh... I actually made too many slides because I wasn't sure of uh, the background of the audience. So I want to ask uh, a few questions and then we're going to tailor the talk <laughs> according to the audience. So uh, first of all, who knows about transformers and how they work? Stick your hands up now. Okay, not so many people. Okay, so I'm going to talk, uh, my talk's going to be about transformers, which are like a revolutionary architecture, but... Uh, those who know about it, I'm going to skip a lot of the maps so I can give the intuitions, because I think the majority of the audience wasn't so, uh, probably doesn't know about them. Now, that's the first question. The second question is, who knows about Markov random fields? Stick your hand up. Okay, again, a few. Okay, so then uh, I've probably got twice as many slides, but half of them are maps, so they're going to be cut out. Uh, and we're going to talk about some intuitions and try and give you a... Give it, so give you something so that everybody can um, take something away from the talk. Now, um, so uh, the reason this was uh, partly in Chinese is because uh, uh, I ran, I was just giving a, a talk in China and then uh, they one of my students translated it for me, which is kind of fun. So anyway, I run um, a computer vision group at Oxford and also uh, I founded some uh, companies. And we started off as a computer vision group uh, uh, you know, working on all aspects of computer vision, recognition, segmentation, these things. And then gradually we morphed into uh, into a deep learning group because, yeah, deep learning is just being used to disrupt everything. And, uh, you know, we've got we've got lots and lots of uh, industry collaborators. All the big tech companies uh, are working with us on different projects. So it's kind of an exciting time, I think, actually, to be doing this um, because stuff that... Uh, uh, I've been doing for a, a while, has gradually become um, uh, more important. Uh, research directions at the moment are things like continual learning, uh, including domain generalization and adaptation. 
Um, what what do you want to do? Just to end. Oh, okay. Do you want me to? I can admit yeah, you yeah, that yeah. they beat <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, robustness, estimation of uncertainty, and of course, you know, the first level was computer vision. So I've worked in uh, this area for about thirty years. Um, started off uh, doing a pure maths degree, and then went on to do a PhD at Oxford. Um, you know, that was kind of a big, big thrill for me because uh, I was, uh, you know, from a very working class family. Then I went to work at Microsoft Research uh, for about six years. And uh, it was kind of interesting at that point because, um, you know, there still weren't really any applications, you know, that even when we worked at Microsoft Research, we were working, you know, on computer vision and machine learning. And, People were going, well, it could be useful one day, but it's not that interesting. So the irony was the moment I left, I left, I actually always wanted to move back to Oxford. So first time I became a professor at Oxford Brooks, later on at uh, Oxford University. And one of the big ironies was over this course of time, like, uh, you know, I was able to do much more tra tech transfer than I was when I was at Microsoft, just because of the sudden explosion in like uh, capability of, uh, of uh, computer vision and machine learning. Um, you know, you could think like there are sort of um, different eras of computer vision. So when I first started, I first started in the 90s and everyone was still going, you know, oh, maybe we can understand humans and the brain. And, you know, people were really like looking at uh, uh, psychophysicists to try and look at all these experiments, try and work out what happened. And um, uh, it, it kind of like the big movement and the trend, I think, maybe even started... Uh, uh, by Mar, but was actually to think, well, let's not worry about how humans do it. Let's try and make computational models. Maybe we can take some inspiration from humans, but actually we should just try and work out, you know, what is the uh, thing we're trying to optimize, work out a loss function for that, and then how to optimize it given a, a particular algorithm. And that's kind of a general methodology, you know, think what's my uh, cost function to solve this, and then how can I minimize that cost function? What algorithms would allow me to do that? And so in the 90s, I worked a lot on uh, geometry and 3D reconstruction. I'll show you some examples. 2000s was a reawakened interest in object recognition. And then 2010s, with this sort of, you know, happy confluence of GPUs developed for gaming, the internet spreading everywhere, giving us lots of data, and very old algorithms of neural networks. So I saw Jeff Hinton speak when I was a student and got really inspired by neural networks. And, uh, but it was only then this was the right time to do them because you had the uh, hardware and GPUs and you also had the data. And then finally, you know, that came back. So in the 90s, I worked a lot on geometry, uh, 3D reconstruction, and this led to a spin out company called 2D3. And what they did was they'd actually, for films, work out the 3D of the scene uh, in order to insert computer generated characters and actually won a technical Emmy. Uh, so, you know, we'd have like, uh, uh, this is all sort of old stuff now, but, you know, we'd have this sort of, you know, uh, swish of Pompeii where the uh, camera had taken it. And then we worked on all sorts of algorithms for uh, detecting points and tracking them. So here's going to be the tracked points. And then once you have those point tracks, we actually worked out um, all of these uh, uncalibrated methods, meaning we didn't need to calibrate the cameras in order to do the 3D reconstruction. So there's a 3D reconstructed points and the camera location so that you could insert computer generated characters. And so that was kind of like uh, work in the 90s. It got used in loads of films like Harry Potter and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Lord of the Rings and all this sort of stuff. Here's it being used in Gladiator. So this uh, this is our software. So they had this, that's the Colosseum as it is today. They tracked it and then they 3D reconstructed uh, 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 the world and then inserted onto that 3D reconstruction, the ancient Colosseum. So it's kind of cool, right? Uh, and it kind of shows, you know, with like um, these sorts of techniques, you can really do some fun things. So uh worked a lot on that for this sort of uh, film industry went to microsoft microsoft was um a really good training time for me but it was a really barren time because it's primarily at that point an operating system company and trying to do any research on computer vision or machine learning so the best we could do was we did some stuff that uh basically could segment out for image editing it got used in powerpoint um yeah so we did basically interactive segmentation um, I then left and worked um, also, I consulted a lot for Sony, and uh, Sony uh, PlayStation 
they had this precursor to Connect. So who's heard of Connect? So uh, Connect was a, um, a thing, uh, well, actually I'll tell you what the PlayStation was. It was in the, the iToy, it's a camera placed on top of the uh, console. Uh, there's the camera here. And uh, it would film you and then insert you into the games in some way. So this was some work we did um, uh, with Sony. And the idea was that, again, it would use the segmentation, it would track you, and then you could see yourself in this fantasy world. And that actually sold um, about 700,000 units. So that's pretty cool. Um, so uh, I kind of, um, after being at Brooks for a while, I went to... Uh, I went to uh, Oxford, and actually uh, in Oxford, I did a set of machine learning based spin outs, which I'll quickly tell you about. Uh, so, one is Oxite. So, the idea is that it's augmented reality glasses. Uh, the reason for this is because um, there's a huge amount of people across the world who suffer central sight loss. So, the idea is to develop transparent displays that will then also highlight uh, things of interest. So, it could be giving them an impression of depth by estimating the depth in the scene and giving like a heat map of the depth. It could be, you know, I've lost my keys, highlighting where the keys were. So, um, so that's Oxide. Um, uh, also, I was involved in an autonomous car company. So autonomous cars are probably uh, were like my uh, dream thing. So 2016, we set up something called Five AI to do autonomous cars in England. And uh, yeah, this was super exciting because it's basically all the problems to do with computer vision, three D reconstruction, object recognition, and the like. Uh, we ran our first trial in 2020 in Croydon. I don't know if any of you ever tried it. Uh, the problem was then lockdown hit. So we had to go all online. So we pivoted the company just to do online simulation and it got acquired by Bosch. So that was kind of cool. And, uh, and I'm now an advisor to Bosch. Um, and then the last company that I set up in lockdown was um, to uh, huge amounts of uh, wastage for uh, clothing. So it seems like there's a good opportunity because online clothing became a really big thing in, uh, in lockdown. Uh, lots of it returned because it doesn't fit. People don't like the look of it. So uh, this company uh, is basically doing, you, you film yourself with your phone, it reconstructs you and displays the clothes on you. So uh, yeah, that's kind of cool. Um, okay, so that's that company. Okay, so the reason I was describing this, partly to give you a bit of background, partly because lots of you don't know what a transformable microphone and field is, so I thought I'd also just tell you more about the applications that I've been involved in. And also partly because um, I've always been, a, you know, when you're choosing problems, it's quite important to choose the right problems. And for me, choosing the right problems means choosing something, if you're going to solve something, make it something that people will care about. And there are, there are different ways. So one would be commercially, maybe they're going to buy your uh, technology. That's one way people might show their concern. Or another is to, you know, you, especially in universities, perhaps we can um, help people who are less advantaged, like partially sighted or somebody, and try and change their lives. So I think always when I'm choosing, like, you know, machine learning or computer vision problems, I try to choose ones where I think they will make a difference to somebody. Um, uh, so, yeah, as I say, we've got um, related to that, then we've got continual learning, robustness estimation of uncertainty and actually a lot of these are related to AI safety it's become hugely hot I'm kind of involved in a bit in that myself now and uh, I think that as we go to the next generation of uh, machine learning algorithms making them robust making them explain themselves and having uncertainty estimates will be hugely important for um, AI safety and you know this was motivated by my experience in uh, in autonomous cars you know because you can get all sorts of problems and if you've got poor robustness, you know, if it thinks that old lady is a road, uh, if it can't explain what it's doing, um, then, you know, the consequences could be very serious. You know, somebody might lose a life. So that's why, um, you know, these problems are important. And also, um, you know, we've got a big push on continual learning. And, you know, it's just because so much data is being generated each day. You know, 306 billion emails are sent, 500 million tweets. You know, just a, it's a staggering amount of data that's being created. So what continual learning means is that we're going to not be, it's just not even energy efficient to retrain models from scratch anymore. We need to have models that continuously adapt to this very high throughput of data. And actually, if I get time, uh, I'm going to talk about that. Um, I kind of got uh, inspired by uh, continual learning also because partially sighted people, they might go into the 
uh, room and there might be new objects they want to learn. So you have to in incorporate that into machine learning. Or for like autonomous driving, you know, as you go down a route, maybe there's roadworks, maybe it's rained, maybe it's snowed. So you have to do what you know, people in robotics call lifelong learning. Um, so, uh, as I say, we've got this big range of work going on. So uh, in order to uh, try and give you something on the technical side now, so I'll switch more to the technical side, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about one of the problems uh, and take it on a little journey because it's kind of interesting. Um, by the way, is there a timing thing so I can judge how much? What time shall I finish? I've got my... Uh, um, 16.55, including questions. Okay, then, then we're going at a good rate. Am I talking too quickly for anyone? Like, is it, uh, is it comprehensible? No, okay, it's, it's okay. Good. Okay, good. Good, because there's lots to go through, so I wanted to uh, move at a relatively rapid pace. So um, we've got uh, scene segmentation. So I got really interested in that for several reasons. One, obviously, is the autonomous car. Where's the road? Where's the person? The other is a partially sighted person. Where's the door? So, you know, I felt like object recognition should always be more than just finding a bounding box, because with these sorts of applications, you really need to see the shape of things. Um, yeah, so there's the uh, partially sighted demo. You know, you can then make out the person and what they're doing a little bit more. I like that. So Markov Random Fields was what I worked a lot on. You don't need to know this because everything's been superseded by uh, by uh, uh, deep learning. I guess it's more uh, for historical purposes. But what they do would be they would um, you basically be you know typically for an image you divide it up. You'd have a variable per pixel, and you'd be trying to estimate a label or a, a definition for that uh, for that or a class for that pixel. So every pixel would have a class. It might be like this is road, this is door. And um, you also have like an energy function. So you formulate this as an optimization where there's a probability of a big door or class, but also you have an, a pairwise probability that says, if my uh, neighboring pixel is door, then I'm more likely to be door. Um, so that's the form of the energy function. You have these variables per, uh, per pixel, and then you have uh, these interrelations between the pixels. And, uh, that uh, I worked on a lot, and it could, uh, by using different types of methods, you could uh, solve these uh, uh, solve these Markov random fields, and then you could pop out segmentations, which is kind of good. And um, the way it often worked, the way these solutions worked, would be often you'd have like a probability distribution over the set of classes you'd be, and then you do something called message passing, where each one would say, hey, I think I'm this, to its neighbors, and um, then the neighbors would update depending upon the messages it received. So that's an example of a message passing algorithm. Um, it's a bit like you just keep iterating. You say, I, I have this probability distribution, you send it to your neighbors, and then you keep iterating until convergence. And that's one way of solving these Markov random fields. Now, interestingly, if you're doing that, is actually, so we had this paper, uh, which got over 3,000 citations. And it's actually very like a deep network. So uh, when we saw deep networks, so luckily I was in um, Oxford at the time, Andrew Zissiman, who did the VGG net, which got very famous, was upstairs. They did a breakthrough where they, um, where they, uh, where they uh, showed this control object recognition. And so immediately, you know, my group started working on, um, on uh, various things to do with uh, CNNs. So this message passing is exactly what neural networks do. So if I take my network and I make multiple copies of it, instead of passing messages to each other, you can imagine I'm just creating a copy, passing my messages as before, updating my states. So it just becomes like a neural network. You're passing your messages to each to the next layer of the network, and that those network uh, parameters are updating accordingly. So then we had um, we had a, uh, a paper showing that uh, you know these convolutional neural networks could be treated combined with the uh, were actually CRFs, and uh, and then we got again to state of the art in segmentation for that, and we had this online demo which was kind of cute. Um, and, you know, it's really fun, actually. It was really interesting just to see how powerful neural networks were at that time. Um, now, 
I'm coming on to the thing I'm going to talk about mostly, which are transformers. So um, what happened was that there was, a, in parallel with all this breakthroughs in vision, where CNNs uh, became powerful, and deep learning started to be applied to, um, uh, to uh, language. And what happened was that uh, um, uh, convolutional neural networks, by their nature, are quite good for images, because images uh, you know, you can imagine images very naturally fit with convolutions. Um, instead, uh, in language, people started to look at a, an architecture called the transformer, and this became um, very popular. And again, we looked at the transformer, and it's the same sort of idea. So uh, before we had a fully uh, convolutional neural network doing, um, doing uh, uh, the... Um, uh, segmentation, but actually what transformers do, so for um, for uh, language, they'll have um, maybe a set of tokens, these might be the letters of a word, and uh, what they do is then they have an attention which goes to, they basically propagate um, self-attention, so uh, and this becomes very like message passing, so you might have, in fact, if I'd known, I would have had a graphic for explaining transformers if I'd known them. But what you can do is imagine now, okay, so let's think about the image case. The way a transformer works for image segmentation is you'll divide the image up into a set of patches. Um, these are a bit like your tokens. So in, in uh, uh, language, um, the tokens might be words or they might be, uh, uh, they might be characters. Let's not too worry too much about what they are. And what they do is... Um, they pass messages as to what they should be to the other words and the other things. So if I if I have a task and I want to translate um, the cat uh, sat on the mat, um, what transformers basically do is they will have a set of variables for the tokens or embeddings, and they pass messages between them and keep doing that over however deep uh, the method, is, uh, however deep the network is. So we did, um, we basically adapted transformers for, uh, for images. So it, again, it's a kind of message passing. So it's a bit like passing messages between all the tokens and that's just what transformers are. They have a slightly different architecture because they use what's called a query and a key. So uh, it's an asymmetric message. So the message that one say uh, cat might pass to sat would be not the same. I might have some. Um, I might have some slides to actually explain the basics of transformers. I kind of assume there would be knowledge of transformers, but we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so uh, let's. But I might have some slides uh, a little bit further on. Anyway, let's just say uh, we applied transformers to uh, image segmentation. It got to state of the art. The code's online. Uh, the paper got about two thousand citations. Uh, it won this uh, some uh, Chinese Test of Time award, which was kind of cool, and uh, inspired a lot of other uh, work on uh, on uh, segmentation. So, did all this work on segmentation. Uh, really love working on graphs and you know trying to optimize functions on graphs. And actually, what really became interesting is now uh, you know a new really big growth area is AI for science. So uh, this is Will Chen, who's like uh, the lead author on this paper. And the idea um, would be, could we take some of these graph algorithms and apply them for AI for science? And why do graphs occur in science? Well, molecules are graphs, right? So you've got all these uh, uh, molecular, uh, you know, molecular structures. And one thing that's super important for molecular structures is like predicting the properties of them. So if you want to like say, there might be chemical properties like elasticity or something like this, or they might be like, does this drug you know, cure cancer, is it going to make your hair fall out? So, you know, it's kind of like, um, uh, yeah, super important to be able to, from those molecules, be able to predict the properties. Because all the time, so I talk with like big pharma companies like Novo Nordisk who are developing new drugs, all the time they're basically trying to, um, trying to do, you know, where should we explore? What sort of drugs should we be synthesizing and testing? So if you can actually help with that and say, make some predictions about where, where they should be, uh, you know, what they should be testing, you know, you can save billions of dollars effectively. 
So um, there are all these um, machine learning uh, data sets. It's uh, like Zinc's a free data set. It's got uh, uh, 230 million uh, uh, compounds and uh, it's also got like properties of those compounds. So kind of fun. Um, that's like typical molecules there. Uh, and like in order to um, solve, uh, you know, some of these uh, things, message passing, as I said, a bit like Markov random fields is also used. So you might have like some, you know, some latent variables on each of the uh, atoms, and then they just pass messages to their neighbors, update those latent states. And then you might use that for classification later as to what the properties would be. Um, so, you know, as I say, it might work like this. You might have a latent space here, you might have some uh, latent space here, and then you update the central one based on its neighbors. And then you just keep doing that. You keep picking different atoms and updating based upon their neighbors. And that, that's what message passing is, both in uh, pixel space or image space, but also in molecular space. Problems with it though, are that um, it has uh, over smoothing. So you end up just smoothing things out too much. And you also end up with uh, information bottlenecks. Like uh, say I've got a gra two graphs here and a graph here, and I've only got this one connection, then it can only transmit messages through there. So you're compressing all the information in these two subgraphs into, uh, into that bottleneck. So that could be a huge problem. Uh, so people have also tried to apply transformers on graphs. They're also like messages. Uh, so you might have, but it's like fully connected now. So but basically any atom can pass a message to any other atom. Do you have any water, by the way? <laughs> water. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, transformers help a bit, but there are some problems with transformers. If you have messages from uh, every atom to every other <laughs> atom, you've thrown away the structure of the graph. And so there's a big problem in how do you um, how do you get the structure of the graph? Now, if the data was um, you know in Euclidean space, you know you could give it coordinates, but all you've got is a graph. You know it could be rotated, it could be stretched. So there's no natural coordinate system for it. Now, people have some people have uh, tried to embed um, the nodes of the graph by looking at what's called a Laplacian matrix. So a Laplacian matrix is basically something that says uh, it has uh, an adjacency matrix where this is one of this element is adjacent to this element. Um, and it also has a degree which says how many edges go out. And uh, why is that interesting? Why do we need to know about these Laplacians? Well, if you take the eigenvectors of the Laplacian, you end up with something which will give you a coordinate system for that graph. So that's why people use it. So then you can use the transformer and still input the graph structure. Um, there are problems then, it still doesn't work. Uh, why doesn't it work? Because um, if uh, the eigen, uh, when you take an eigen decomposition of this matrix, if it has um, some equal eigenvalues, you end up with a subspace where it's ambiguous and there are many solutions for these eigenvectors. So you might end up with something where there's not a unique solution for the eigenvectors. So a uh, way to fix this is what we did. We um, did something which was called a random walk. So it's a very old computer vision algorithm. And the idea is that for every um, uh, edge here, you have a probability of jumping to another edge, okay? So uh, if I was here, um, I would define that probability uniformly. So from here, I'd have a one third going there, one third going there, one third going there. Uh, if I was here, I've got three going out, it's all a third. Uh, if I was here, I've only got two going out and it's a half. Now, okay, you're going, wow, but why, why are we defining that? Well, the thing is, if you raise this, oh, brilliant. <laughs> That's great, thanks. If you raise this matrix up to a power, what it does is it shows you if I started in this main, so if I started here, what's the chance of being here or here or here? So I start raising that to increasing powers. It shows the distribution of jumping from one edge to another after like say K hops. Um, why is that interesting? It's because it allows you to in some way specify a pairwise distance 
between the uh, edges of these graphs. And the reason that's interesting is because what we're going to do is make a transformer which not only takes the nodes of the graphs, but also takes the edges of the graph. And this will be the positional encoding, the relative coordinate system for the edges. And um, when we tried that, so now we're going to um, alter the transformer. We're going to use the nodes and edges as tokens, and we're going to have a positional embedding on the edges. When we did that, it just worked a lot better. Okay, let me see how I'm doing on time. Okay, I'm doing good. Um, so uh, now I'm going to talk about a few different works. Like, so transformers are really cool. Um, they've definitely made a lot of progress. We got state of the art on uh, molecular prediction. We got state of the art on segmentation. We're really interested. Are they innately better? Innately better in some way than CNNs? Are transformers kind of improved over CNNs? Uh, Current literature is really biased for transformers. They cracked a lot of problems. Uh, and, you know, they think maybe because of this self-attention mechanism, um, it's like, uh, uh, you know, somehow, uh, you know, improved. Is it true? So um, neural networks are very accurate on the whole, but they're often very confident when they're wrong. So if you look at the... Uh, you know, the logits, and you make them into a probability score, it's often not very good. That means they're not very well calibrated. They might say something with absolute certainty, but be absolutely certainly wrong. Whereas what you'd like them to do is, you know, if they said, I'm 90% certain, then you'd like 90% of those predictions to be correct. If you said 10% certain, you'd like only 10% of those predictions to be correct. Um, they also um, are overconfident when you get to, uh, to what... Slightly ambiguously, it's called active distribution data. So, you know, maybe I take all my images in the sunshine, I look up for something in the rain, and now it kind of screws up my um, classifier. Um, the same if you uh, distort the image uh, somehow, um, that can also lead to being very overconfidently wrong. Um, so what we want to do is see whether, you know, whether we can uh, assess whether either transformers or CNNs are more robust or reliable. And the statements in the literature, at least before our work, were, you know, there were lots of big shots who were saying, you know, um, on out of distribution, on confidence, um, on generalization, um, on our calibration, that transformers were just clearly better. So we looked at all these studies, uh, you know, and we tried to normalize, you know, for a number of parameters and for all the tricks that they used to try and make it more balanced. And um, what we found, so this is our paper, which was at uh, ECCB last year. Um, what we found is actually it's not true. So we checked for things like um, uh, simplicity bias. So simplicity bias is something that's really interesting in deep networks. So you might have um, a deep network train. And imagine there are, say I've got um, a whole load of uh, red, um, red post boxes. What would tend to happen is if there are two features which the neural network can use, it will pick up, if it's if all the post boxes are red, it will tend to pick up on redness, but not the shape. So it will tend to use color rather than shape. And actually there are many examples of this. So when um, often, uh, when you're doing just classification, the neural network will only pick up on some features and not use all of them. And those features we call simple features, and it means there's a simplicity bias. And what we found is both transformers and CNNs are equally vulnerable to the simplicity bias. Um, in fact, if anything, transformers tend to try and classify based on the background much more than CNNs, which is not kind of uh, so good. Um, and also they tend to rely um, a sometimes a little bit more on texture than CNNs, but they're not so good on a... a both of them are about um, the same on out of distribution and on calibration. So I, I think when we talk about transformers versus CNNs, we need to be a bit careful. There's no clear winner. Uh, it's going to be, you know, there are other things, lots of other tricks. And there's this modern ConvNet, which uses lots of modern tricks to improve this. OK. <clears throat> We're doing good, so. Um, so now I'm going to talk about... Uh, a little bit about, okay, let's think about, uh, we're training a model, okay? So 
In the old days, it would have been great. We get some data, we train the model. Uh, now, a uh, lot more data. It's kind of getting harder for universities to compete. Uh, and, you know, now perhaps all we can do uh, is fine tune some big model from some, one of these big, uh, you know, big, uh, uh, big corporations because, uh, you know, they require so much data. There's all of this uh, uh, self supervised stuff. And so, you know, it might not always be possible to, um, for some of the more ambitious examples to uh, train from scratch. Um, but the problem is now uh, big corps got even bigger and even fine tuning the models is getting to be you know, hard. So some of the large language models that are being released, even the open source ones, you know, they've got uh, many, many parameters. So it's very hard to um, fine tune them. So what people have been doing, uh, say for language uh, models, but for anything that's a transformer, but it's easier to explain it, is what's called um, uh, context-based fine tuning. And so, um, you know, this might be in several ways, but it's a bit like giving a verbal instruction to your uh, to your uh, to your uh, transformer. So uh, you might have some like you know uh, uh, context, which could be, for instance, you know, sets of translations examples, or it might be uh, you know some instructions about what the language models should do. You know, translate English into Bulgarian. So instead of having to train from scratch something that translates English to Bulgarian, you just take an existing large language model and you give it like uh, you give it some sort of um, uh, context uh, beforehand, and you say, you know, that's going to be a task, and then you use that as the classifier. And that's, you know, with discrete tokens, you know, with language, but you could also actually just optimize the, uh, so the language is converted into an embedding in the model, which then is input, but instead of um, giving it language, you could also just optimize that continuous embedding. So there's a really interesting question. Um, if we're if you know that's the way we're moving is um uh you know we might have prompting which is going to be n discrete tokens that would be like you know translate english into bulgarian we might have soft prompting which is just going to optimize some um you know some uh uh input embedding to give the task prefix tuning is something where we um inject like a uh, soft prompt to every layer and then full fine tuning is when we optimize the weights uh, now, obviously, if we just do words, we can't get to every function, right? Because that's going to have a countable, finite uh, uh, number of, uh, well, depends on the length of the input. But it seems like uh, it's going to be like, say we limit uh, the input to n discrete tokens for computational reasons. It's going to have some finite um, amount of uh, uh, functions we can define. That means, you know, if we're saying trying, you know, each one will be a task, but we can't necessarily get to all tasks. Um, and not the same as if we optimize the weights. With these other ones, once we do soft prompting, we've got a potentially infinite input to our transformer. But the question comes, can we actually um, do the same as like fine tuning? Um, and the interesting thing is, uh, for the benefit of those who uh, don't know transformers is that you probably can't. And the reason is because when you do these prompting based methods, what they tend to do within the transformer yeah. is just rescale the attention values. So they rescale you. If you look at like unwrap the mathematics, they rescale the attention values. And then um, they, after rescaling, they add like a bias towards um uh, a certain point in space um, defined uh, at like a fixed point. So it means that when you're doing these prompting based methods, so everyone's like on about prompt tuning and all of this sort of stuff for, uh, for, uh, for transformers, but it may uh, not give you as much flexibility and strength as fine tuning. Uh, so when can it work? Why does it work so well, the fine uh, it's a prompt tuning. So what it does is when you typically, when you have these large uh, pre-trained models, you've trained them on a set of tasks. So implicitly they've got some information hidden around them. And what prompt tuning tends to do is if it, if on this pre-training, one of these tasks is the same as your new task, 
then it will work. You know, if it's got enough similarity, the pre-training, because it will re-rate the attentions accordingly and allow you to get to that. But if the task is very different for uh, your pre-trained tasks, then it's, uh, you know, your prompt tuning just isn't going to work very well. And I won't go through the details of this because uh, I'll probably wrap up fairly soon after one more thing. But uh, that's our that's one of our latest papers, which will be um, which will be when uh, prefix and uh, prompt tuning work in practice. So let's just go to something again. We're really interested, as I said, really interested in continual learning. Um, you know, we have these uh, big, you know, very large trained models like CLIP, trained on lots of uh, of uh, images and text. Um, there are all sorts of ways that you can use these big models. You might have like a zero shot thing where you just take the embedding and then train it for your particular task. You might have a linear probe, which is going to add another layer onto the end, uh, a linear classifier, and use those embeddings for your um, new task. Uh, you might have prompt tuning that I've just discussed, where you're going to, you know, try to uh, to learn an, an additional input that will help you and your downstream task. And you've also got adapters, which are like little uh, neural networks attached to the last few layers. So these are the flavors of fine tuning. Um, and of course, you've got end to end fine tuning. Um, I kind of uh, I said a little bit before about why to end to end fine tune. And, you know, empirically, always the results have been much better for end to end fine tuning. Um, now, one of the things that we're interested in is continual learning. So supposing I have a set of tasks. So this might be to classify language into types of different types of things. Maybe there's going to be new misinformation appearing on the Internet. Um, you know, there are all sorts of reasons as as time progresses, why we end up with new tasks on the Internet. And we might want to train one of these big pre-trained models without forgetting how to do all of its um, previous tasks. And it's kind of interesting because if you, you know, we've decided that fine tuning is the best, but if you only fine tune, very often it destroys all the information that's in the network and we lose all of that prior information. So another thing we're interested in is how to preserve, how to fine tune on a task, still be able to do well on that task and yet preserve previous information. And um, just to uh, shorten it and explain uh, uh, the uh, way we do that is by having a regularizer that uh, looks at the input output behavior of the network. So what it tries to do is preserve the feature space. So it's an L2 regularizer on the change in feature space. And as well as optimizing for accuracy, I'm going to finish in a second, actually, so I can have uh, time for questions. Uh, as well as optimizing for accuracy, we we'll also preserve an L2 feature uh, space uh, norm, which allows us to um, remember things about previous tasks. So, yeah, I think uh, I probably uh, went at breakneck speed there, but I think I can wrap up because uh, I want to leave some time for questions. Thank you very much. There's certainly time for questions. No, please. Uh, I think you were first, and I go to you. Please. All right. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for the talk. It was, it was fascinating. Thank you. Uh, the deep, uh, the deep dive into how transformers, especially there, uh, it was fascinated by the, the comparison with CNNs, and uh, and actually I have, I have a specific question on this one. Why do you think uh, at the end? Or do you think transformers have outperformed classical CNNs? So I actually, I, I'm not sure yet whether that's, I think they're more, so, so it's, it's sort of, I think for image tasks, mm -hmm. probably a CNN often mm -hmm. might do as well. Mm -hmm. I think it's because, um, just what I was saying, so CNNs came out of the image computer vision type of thing. So convolutions are really good for images, right? Because you just convolve and mm -hmm. it's a very natural operation in images. Mm -hmm. uh, but for language, well, for vision and language, you actually, uh, transformers are good because they're more like um, discrete structures where you can divide up into a set of tokens. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you don't need to have the, you know, because they're not natural. Like, say you look at a sentence, it isn't naturally convolutional. It's more like I've got the elements of a sentence and they form a graph, you know, they want a discrete space. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, another question is about the machine when atoms and talk about using random walks yeah yeah 
can you talk about how was the, the inspiration to actually explore? So actually, I talked to my student and I remembered um, because he was saying, um, OK, so how do we if we want to do a positional encoding for the um, for the elements of a graph? Um, how do we determine the distance between two members? Now, one thing is shortest path, which uh, so you could say, oh, let's do the shortest path between everyone. And that got tried and it worked OK, but not amazingly. And then I remembered um, there was a lot of work back in the 2000s on random walk in uh, computer vision for segmentation. So for kind of like the problem of segmentation, it was used a lot. And uh, the interesting thing about these random walks is that instead of having the shortest path between two distances, it actually considers the average of all the uh, paths. It's a bit like all the paths because it's got probabilities of jumping through. It's like all the paths. So it's kind of um, a little bit richer and shortest path as a representation. And so I just thought that would be interesting to try. I see. I see. But yeah, it was mostly inspired by, you know, it's kind of interesting because there is sometimes as well, what happens is there's quite a few things, even like nerves and these things that I get inspired by stuff that was done ages ago in computer vision, like really old papers, you see them. And then one advantage of getting old is you actually remember them. And then, you, know, you can apply them on the new technology. That's one of the advantages. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Very uh, nice presentation. We have a question about large language model and the tuning with respect to prompt, where you prompt it and single shard or the multi shard. So, how they are different from the prompting if we are doing sort of same thing? Uh, when you say that, uh, I'm just wondering what you mean. So, zero shard, single shard, and multi shard, they are some of the techniques to fine tune it. So are they different from the prompting where you see? Well, the prompt is a slightly different thing, right? Because um, say zero shot, you're probably not doing any learning. Whereas like the prompting, you're actually going to learn the prompt in some way. So you might learn what the best prompt is. So say I want to find a particular, it could be zero shot, but you're still saying, well, what's the best prompt in order to find that new class? So what word should I say to the model in order to get the new class? But they're kind of similar. They're very related. And also I'd say, you know, the terminology is pretty fluid, you know. I mean, it's kind of weird, right? Because um, now I'm always correcting my students because they call, say, click and things like that unsupervised. But I would think it's weakly supervised because it's got um, it's got vision and language together and the language is giving weak supervision. But you could also say it's unsupervised because it's just data that's like being clustered. So it's kind of very, I, I would say some of the terms I kind of like less well defined. I don't even like how to distribution because I don't think it means anything very, you know, clear. And lastly, about the random box, can we, a silly question might be, can we use the reinforcement learning with some random probability? Um, well, this this one is more just for defining um, distances. So there's not um, an action per se in okay. it. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Oh, uh, excellent presentation. <laughs> Wonderful indeed. So my question is about like, I mean, normally traditionally we go for the GAND uh, for uh, different augmentations and others. Now in one of our works, we're considering like bacteria's behavior to analyze like NT, microbial resistance, AMR, this kind of research. And then uh, we need more data. So uh, we are thinking that what about the concept of the vision transformer based GAN instead of the traditional GAN or other, I mean, variants of it. But uh, we are not sure what, which one will work because uh, uh, but the classical images versus like I mean, macro world versus micro world bacteria, uh, they have nothing, uh, uh, I mean, that much uh, features in terms of I mean, feature extraction. And yeah, so we worked so a bit on that, really uh, looking at out of distribution and trying to develop training data for stuff like medical yeah. or astronomical. Uh -huh. And uh, very mixed results so far, not uh, hugely good. Uh, but if you drop me an email, I'll send you on the paper. Uh, yeah, and uh, we can discuss about it because uh, we are working on that and the AMR is a massive thing, but a uh, huge problem, but uh, we need this kind of solutions and, uh, okay, we can discuss later, yes. Yeah, because yes. I, mean, I think if it wasn't there in the training data, mm -hmm. the generative, you're talking about generating yeah, yeah, data, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I think the problem is uh, unless it was trained with some of that data, mm -hmm. it's harder to get it out, you know, usually these things only give you, you know, <clears throat> what they had put in. Yeah. There are at least three more questions, so all right, four. <laughs>
yeah, thank you for your um, thank you, thank you for the presentation. I actually enjoyed it. Oh, um, the first question I have, well, um, yeah, so I've heard people say several times that in production it's quite hard to use transformers. In your opinion, in your experience, how true is that? And secondly, based on what you said, so are you are you saying that if it's um a purely v, um image um task is a CNN, where it's image and vision plus language? Use a transformer. Is that what you, is that? I think so. Yeah, I, but I'm not. I think transformers also work well for vision. So I think it's kind of interesting. I think. Um, I think that. Uh, but I would say, you know, say Trevor Darrell had this work, you know, a CNN for the 2020s, uh, putting in modern tricks, and it seemed like it could work as well. You know, using these CNNs. So I think. Um, I th what I'd say is the jury is still out. And, you know, we'll have to see because it's also hard to tell, right? Because say when they trained um, the visual um, transformer, they use so much compute. And yes. it's so it's like it's like it's very hard to tell when, you know, to get a fair comparison, because if you use that much compute, say for um, a CNN, you might also be able to get a good result. And so it's kind of interesting to, you know. And what was your first question? In the real world production, which, which one do you think is more? And I would say um, it's hard to use transformers. In production, that is just easier in um, papers and likes, but in the real world, it's quite technical and quite complex. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think I think uh, it depends a bit on the application as well, right? So I think that's that's the thing. But uh, that it also, I think there's going to be a lot of open source, so maybe both are getting easier to use as more libraries are developed. Okay. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you for your uh, informative presentation. So. Uh, you have discussed that uh, uh, there is no like uh, direct winner between convolution neural network and uh, visual transformer. So you have uh, you have said that uh, segmentation and molecular prediction was two two kind that you work uh, on yeah. these aspects. Yeah. So what do you think that uh, in future, like in healthcare section or like in other section, which will be like? So I actually think that probably be new architectures. I think that we've only seen, you know, we're still very, even though, you know, it seems like a long time, we're actually very early in, you know, the uh, this journey. I think of, uh, you know, maybe it was like uh, 10 years ago that this stuff broke out and in scientific terms, that's still kind of very uh, short. And I think actually there'll probably be new architectures. And I think what will happen, because actually why are these architectures good or bad? It's based on hardware, right? Hardware is always progressing and there are new things. And so it's not beyond the realms of possibility that new architectures will come out. And if those architectures come out, people will then make algorithms to have an advantage of them. So often like saying machine learning, we're cresting on this wave of this new architectures and new devices. So, you know, who knows? Maybe we'll all be using quantum computers and they, they might have a different, exactly. totally different mechanism. Yeah, and so so I think temporary, you know, in this little local minima we're in, they're dominant. But I really think that, you know, we probably, actually, if you want, you know, it's just we should always be looking at where the hardware guys are going. So uh, what would be your suggestion for professors or new who is going to start study on this? I mean, if you're, if you're starting, if you're just new on it, then I would say study the, because you've got to know the history and the existing stuff before you can decide what's new. So I'd really say, I'd really learn everything to do with um, Transformers, everything to do with CNNs, because you have to know all of that stuff. Okay. So that you, the thing is, until you know the stuff that's been done, it's harder to think of the stuff that you know, has to be done. Okay, there are two more questions, but it might be very short. So I, I mean, maybe should this, I mean, normally transformers are, as you said, and we know that, I mean, they're hugely computational because the parameters and others. Now, when CNN came, we have massively used, but considering the green ICT, green technology, as well as for the age devices, we developed, we are developing. Uh, so similarly for the transformers, I think, I mean, based on these uh, queries, like, I mean, we need to think about how we can reduce this kind of things and develop give the benefits at the same time like swing transformer or others here that could be yeah you know. definitely and i think um also uh more and you know i think there's still a lot of work to understand them because if we understand them we might be able to make them more lightweight yeah so i think you know trying to understand how to uh yeah how to maybe either explain mm -hmm. and then reduce these networks would be interesting okay so, so uh thank you for your wonderful presentation about this new technology so my question is what process or task you will suggest to get high accuracy or output 
for image generation and quality of the image using video grammar or alongside with this technology. So you mean uh, for generative models, what's the best yeah, generative model? Yeah, with, with, uh, with vision transform. I mean, actually, if you're looking generative, I'd probably look at, say, stable diffusion and things like this, because um, transformers more for classification, uh, whereas, like, uh, I think, you know, the uh, stable diffusion type methods are really interesting. But, you know, again, it's kind of interesting, right, because the field moves so fast. One minute it scans, one minute it's VAEs, one minute it's stable diffusion. So who knows where it's going to go? But I definitely I'd look at stable diffusion for image, image generation. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so just a quick question. Yes, I would just want to ask about the explainability. Which one is more for explainability? Or what's your idea? It is, well, that's a great question because I think that's where really interesting research in universities can happen because um, nobody knows. You know, I think this is, and I don't even, okay, so sometimes I think it might not even be possible, right? Because we can't explain the brain. And as these systems get so complex, it's very hard to explain them. But when you actually look at, say, what government wants and what everyone's asking for, at some point, if we have automated decisions and all of these stuff, say we're, um, you know, like, say, a good place where you might apply AI is the law, because there's a huge backlog in cases. Many are simple, which an AI could solve, but it's also going to have to explain why it did it. So I think, um, you know, it's not yet clear. It's a really open question. I think the research on explainability at the moment is just not up to standard and it's a twenty-four million dollar question. It's um, how it will get solved, but it's a great research question. If you would have a sheet with three conclusions, which would I be? What would would I be? Three conclusions in just research or life you know, for your for your presentation <laughs> for my presentation. Uh, I think uh, it's a really great time to be in artificial intelligence. I think, uh, you know, I've worked in it for 30 years and I think now there's so much opportunity for it. And also people get it, right? So people, the general public understand the value. Uh, so I think that, uh, you know, it's just a great One conclusion is it, it's just, it's just a wonderful time. Yes. <laughs> yes. And that's the main conclusion. I think so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So we we'll just uh, move to the slide. Basically, just, I think. Oh, yeah. Just we just. Oh no! I'll be right back. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just uh, on the thing, please. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm in the middle, it's not good. You should be in the middle. Well, <laughs> <it's not laughs> yeah, because yeah, there's well, yeah. Um, I was going to thank you so much. And uh, uh and then for you uh, for your sessions here. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So you want someone to uh, alive, then I think that you can answer. <laughs> yeah, but thank you so much. So we had a wonderful session. So uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, uh, the next session will start now. So I request uh, uh, Professor Sayyid Ali Kubashi to start uh, the session. We have four papers and this is the last session. Uh, um, and uh, we apologize to the participants uh, online because we didn't uh, address any questions from them. If you don't attend, and relax at home, you don't get the chance to get <laughs> questions to ask. Yeah. So, okay, let's start the last session of today. I know maybe you are tired, but the good bit the last session is that we have enough time, you know, for this just to talk as well. Okay, the first paper uh, is from Eddie from the Japan University of Science and Technology. I don't know who is the presenter. What, what, so all of them will be online. Uh, all of we have the videos, so you just uh, 
What is like normal the normal time bonds? Time bonds. Time bonds. Time bonds. So, so, so we play not here, here. and then they will go for the I have a background. Uh, by the way, by the way, voice is not. Probably listen to talk about this. Um, definitely. Oh, where is the voice? Oh, we can see the voice, but can you increase the voice? Yeah, we'll start. Right? Okay. So we start from the beginning now. Increase the volume. Oh, we can increase the volume. Please. What okay.
Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Any question? Okay, I had a question. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I don't know. Uh, I had a question. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, can I can hear you. Okay, so I, I wanted to ask if we use a, another uh, measurement for, uh, you know, you, you use the Euclidean um, uh, uh, distance for your measurement. Mm -hmm. Did you check other other measures, for example, something uh, not Euclidean? And did you see the effect of that? Okay, so so basically, what we were trying to contribute to uh, was uh, the data set. We constructed the Arabic data set, and to evaluate it, we chose the Signet architecture, uh, mainly because uh, this project uh, uh, with the Siamese neural network have been tested cross-lingually. So we we thought that this would be a good a good way to evaluate our data set by testing it uh, cross-lingually with a model that has been used uh, to do the same objective before. So uh, no, we, the only way we tested it was uh, using the uh, the architecture followed by the resignate paper, uh, which employed the uh, the median distance to train the model. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Any any other question? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I am just uh, not taking uh, questions like you. Uh, uh, why did you consider Hindi and Bangla uh, as a data set? Any any reason? Because of Arabic, uh, it could be Iranian would be more uh, closer in terms uh, of. We wanted the uh, the main reason we uh, we didn't find any Arabic open source data set. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to test the transfer learning uh, in this field. Mm -hmm. And to do that, we wanted to test some diverse languages. And we saw that uh, other experiments have been conducted across lingually in these uh, three data sets, namely the English one, the Hindi, and the Bengali one that we used. And that's why we decided to use these, because they provide uh, uh, some some diversity. And as well, that the, uh, the, way that the way that they have been tested before can guide us and get up, give us some insights in our results. Uh, okay, so any ablation study you tried, like based on the seeing, I mean, for these parameters or this kind of uh, transfer learning mechanism, the results are better? Or which language has more closer or giving you more impact? Anything uh, like I, that? I think it was a Bengali one because it was uh, more cursive than English and Hindi. Okay. Uh, but the other research papers suggested that we should use uh, the Persian because it's uh, yeah. Obviously, more uh, closer to Arabic, but we couldn't find uh, an easy uh, open source uh, data set to work with. Anyways, thank you very much. You are talking to a Bengali guy, and uh, your session chair is from Persia. So, <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you very much. much. Yeah. The next paper is paper number 99. We open you ask me.
Thank you very much. Any question? All right. Uh, thank you, the presenter. Um, can you hear us? Yes. Uh, yeah. okay. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for your uh, presentation. Um, why did you use only uh, 14 uh, records uh, to train your model? Uh, sorry, uh, can you please repeat the question again? Um, I I guess, get it uh, totally. Yeah, you have claimed to use only 14 patients as a sample. Yes. In your yes. model. So, yes. add enough uh, records for a model to learn from that data set. Yes. Any justification? Yes. Uh, 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 yes. So, uh, yes, yes. Yes, uh, I guess, uh, so so there are some factors considering in it. So, uh, for example, uh, we were looking for a paper, you know, which has a clinical backing to it. So the paper we used, Elisetil, uh, that is our, let's say, base paper or the, the paper we are getting the clinical validation from. And they used the, actually say, they created the same data set, only 14 patients. But what happened is for each patient, there were actually four to five sessions. So in total, there was actually 60 to 65 samples. And part sample, again, we divided the part sample into windows. So each window was around uh, 20 seconds. So actually, after windowing and after those multiple sessions, we actually had around uh, 376 samples. So I guess that is quite enough sample to you know train a, let's say, explainable model. But again, I am like agree with you like that is not enough but uh for a like a smaller model like ours it is enough and it has presented some like good results as you